a beast with a shockingly disturbing life cycle, an amphibian creature that wreaks havoc on a populated city, an antique mirror, a children's doll, and a marionette. Keep watching to see the scariest horror movie monsters ranked. Warning, this video contains fast flashing images. Viewer discretion is advised, especially for those with photosensitive epilepsy. One of Stephen King's most iconic and terrifying creations was the Overlook Hotel. The Overlook first graced the pages of King's 1977 novel, The Shining, before its feature film debut in 1980. When troubled writer Jack Torrance moves his family into the Overlook as its winter caretaker, he soon discovers that the hotel is full of predatory spirits of deceased guests. Great party, isn't it? The Overlook isn't merely a haunted hotel, though. It's a sentient being with malicious desires and intent, able to corrupt its guests and ensnare them forever. What really drives the terror home is the fact that its horrors are completely personal, using Jack's alcoholism and isolationist tendencies to turn him against his own family. It's a sentient, corrupting hotel that knows its victims and weaponizes their deepest weaknesses against their loved ones in a cycle of blood and death. Few things are scarier. James Wan has created countless monsters throughout his career, but Insidious introduced one of his mightiest. The man with fire in his face was an instant hit from the moment he appeared in the movie's first trailer. Peering into the camera from behind Patrick Wilson, this terrifying glimpse of the creature provided perhaps the most iconic horror trailer moment of the last decade. As a resident of the Further, the man with fire in his face seeks to bring about a new order of chaos by possessing a human body. He has distilled hatred with a snarling face, designed like he's the dictionary definition of Satan's little helper. Once you see that hideous red face, you'll never sleep again. The Predator has been through quite a few iterations over the years, but none of them hold a candle to the original from 1987's Predator. The movie follows a group of Special Forces commandos who go into the Central American rainforest to rescue hostages from guerrilla forces. Unfortunately, they also encounter the Predator, an alien warrior who travels from planet to planet, hunting the universe's most dangerous prey. Initially, the monster appears to have a smooth, metallic face, but this is revealed to be a helmet, under which lies a grotesque face of mandibles and razor-sharp teeth. More than anything, though, the Predator is so scary simply because he's the galaxy's greatest hunter, so much so that even a team of elite soldiers don't stand a chance against him. One of the scariest monsters in 21st century horror never shows its true face. Still, the spirit of King Paimon lingers in the dark and quiet terror of every moment of Hereditary. Ari Aster's feature debut coats the air with a choking sense of wrongness from early on, allowing the dread of Paimon's unseen force to escalate into a wild and horrifying climax. Hereditary makes Paimon so scary by refusing to explain him, instead offering clues and details leading up to a final, gruesome revelation. That the family's tragedies have all been in honor of this dark deity. The audience doesn't know exactly what he wants or why, but it's clear that he gets it by causing deep hurt and tremendous fear. The fact that his manipulations feed on situations that can happen to anyone, including mental illness, accidents, aging, and death, makes Payman's power all the more frightening. Cloverfield is a phenomenal experiment in perspective and destruction. The title references Project Cloverfield, the government code name for an extraterrestrial beast that crashes into the ocean and begins destroying New York City. The movie depicts all this through the found footage perspective of partygoers forced to flee for their life. There's no defense and nowhere you can escape given the monster's gargantuan size. The helpless feeling that Cloverfield stirs is the ultimate horror vibe, and that's without even mentioning the creatures it creates. All in all, Clover makes for one of the great American monsters since Y2K, and one that even die-hard kaiju fans will likely never forget. Often dubbed one of the scariest movies of all time, The Exorcist caused fainting spells, walkouts, and countless shudders of disgust when it premiered theatrically in 1973. Archival footage of audience reactions at the time shows that people were far more scared of Reagan McNeil than her possessor, Pazuzu. Because I have a little girl, and it was like watching my little girl. It makes perfect sense why a 12-year-old girl, covered in neon green vomit and with blood oozing from every orifice, continues to inspire nightmares to this day. Something seemingly harmless and gentle is transformed into an inhuman threat. Her demonic voice changing and her physical contortions an affront to human nature itself. She is at once innocent and corrupted, and there's no concrete explanation as to why she was even marked for possession in the first place. This is what's truly so terrifying about Regan. If the devil chose her to be his vessel, what's to say he can't claim you? You. Ron Underwood's classic 1990 creature feature, Tremors, achieves an incredible feat, making roided-out earthworms seem threatening. 
Originally theorized to be extraterrestrial, these sightless underground monsters are discovered to be prehistoric rabble-rousers who like to eat livestock, cars, and the occasional bit of human flesh as a treat. When they descend upon the high desert, mountain-bound town of perfection, Nevada, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. Sensing the vibrations humans make, it's easy for the creatures, dubbed graboids in the movie itself, to hunt down their next meal. You'll never want to use a pogo stick ever again. Godzilla is one of the most iconic and enduring monsters in the history of cinema. Ishiro Honda's 1954 masterpiece was born from the anti-nuclear movement following World War II and the H-bomb testing at Bikini Atoll, with the titular kaiju serving as a stand-in for Japan's well-founded fears of nuclear annihilation. Inspired by the havoc wrought by the Castle Bravo nuclear weapons test, Godzilla's skin was designed after the keloid scars covering the bodies of Hiroshima survivors. His atomic breath wreaks the same havoc on the people of Japan that the U.S. military had subjected them to. Even today, Godzilla remains an unforgettable, horrifying creature, not because of his size or appearance, but because of the history that created him. The Descent is one of the 2000s' greatest horror triumphs, and at the heart of its horror are the countless impy-like feral beasts that will devour anybody who comes their way. The crawlers are a species of humanoids who have evolved underground, physically adapting to the landscape of subterranean cave systems. Their ears are pointed, noses rigid and flat against faces like a bat, exhibiting nocturnal traits on top of their predatory instincts. Crawlers scale walls, hunt using echolocation, and don't need flares to see. And the way they scamper, gliding with ease across slippery rock faces, is enough to make you want to never go near a cave again. Sadly, the movie's protagonists are no match for the creatures that view the humans as invaders, as the crawlers chase, kill, and consume them with ease. A remake of the beloved B-movie of the same name, The Fly showcases the revolting demise of Jeff Goldblum's Dr. Seth Brundle, a brilliant scientist who believes he has discovered the key to teleportation. In what would become quite possibly the biggest drunken mistake ever put to film, Dr. Brundle attempts to test his telepods on himself, unknowingly merging himself with a housefly in the process. Thanks to some Academy Award-winning practical makeup work, the unsightly vision of Dr. Brundle's metamorphosis has been effectively terrifying and grossing out audiences for nearly four decades. As Bella Lugosi's version of the vampiric Count Dracula once said, There are far worse things waiting man, then death. The legacy of the Universal Monsters films spans nearly a century, but it all began with the original vampire classic, 1931's Dracula. The true terror of Bela Lugosi's performance as the Count is not in jump scares or dramatic makeup effects. Instead, it's in how undeniably electric he is on screen, able to successfully lull the audience into his trap with a well-placed smile and the delicate raise of an eyebrow. His vocal pattern has since become the default for what Count Dracula should sound like too, providing the perfect combination of creepiness and captivation. Andrzej Zuławski's psychological horror drama Possession is a film that feels as if it defies description, Better suited as an experience rather than something to watch, Possession tells the story of Sam Neill's Mark, a spy who, upon realizing his wife is seeking a divorce, is thrown into a world of nightmarish psychosis as he slowly uncovers the truth of her infidelity. The film was banned in many places upon its release in 1981, due in large part to the way horror and sexuality are visually intertwined throughout. Indeed, Possession is a film as sexualized as it is horrific, with Isabel Adjani's Anna seeking the pleasure not of a random lover, but of a gooey, gruesome, tentacled monster. The creature is given minimal screen time, but the image of it writhing on top of her is enough to sear itself into the subconscious of anyone watching. Possum, the depressing, psychological horror film directed by Matthew Holness, tells a story as disturbing as the terrifying puppet monster that gives the film its title. The plot follows a disgraced children's puppeteer named Philip Connell, who is forced to revisit his childhood home, where his feeble uncle now resides. The only bag he brings on his journey is a leather duffel bag that houses a spider-like marionette called Possum, which haunts Philip throughout his visit. He tries to discard the puppet, but no matter what he does, Possum seems to make its way back to him. For much of the film, only the puppet's massive spider legs are visible, making the reveal of the spider's human face all the more horrific. The ritual is about a lot of things, such as toxic masculinity, the pain of growing apart from your friends, and the dangers of camping. 
but it also happens to feature one of the coolest original creature designs in recent memory. After a group of friends go on a trek into the woods, they awaken a Norse giant named Motor, the ill-gotten son of Loki, god of mischief. Motor is a horrifying creation. He's part stag and part human corpse, with a man's torso for a face and arms hanging down below his mouth like a warthog's tusks. He's also huge, towering over the humans who discover him. The ritual is a slow-burning nightmare, but the glorious horror of Motor is more than worth the wait. Michael Myers holds an esteemed place in the horror baddie pantheon by virtue of being one of the earliest and scariest slasher icons. Originally titled The Babysitter Murders, John Carpenter's 1978 film Halloween established the coverall-wearing, blade-wielding killer as a silent, stalking force of evil. The shape, as he's known in the script, killed his older sister on Halloween night of 1963 when he was a child. Following a lengthy stay in a mental institution, Michael escapes and returns to Haddonfield for another round of slicing and dicing. What was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Only appearing on one night of the year in one specific town, but so unkillable as to prompt a slew of sequels, Myers is more myth than man at this point, and that makes him all the more terrifying. Valak is the closest thing the Conjuring movies have to an overarching big bad. The demon has made some brief appearances in a number of movies in the franchise, but finally gets his time in the spotlight in The Nun. First summoned by a Romanian duke, the fallen angel soon gets cozy on Earth and begins possessing nuns at a secluded monastery. Valak's fear factor depends on what face he's wearing, and in The Nun, he masquerades as, you guessed it, a nun, showing off his ability to infiltrate the most respected orders of the religion that rebukes him. Valak's shows of force are sometimes blatant, but at times he can be more sinister and creeping in his methods. No matter what form he takes, though, one thing's for sure, he's one freaky demon. Steven Spielberg delivered perhaps one of the most universal terrors in cinema history in 1975 with Jaws. Not only did he essentially create the summer blockbuster as we know it, but the movie also introduced us to one of the most terrifying monsters to ever grace the silver screen. So what made the shark, affectionately known as Bruce, so terrifying? You're gonna need a bigger boat. It all starts with that famous tagline, you'll never go in the water again. Virtually anyone who has ever seen Jaws has likely experienced a moment of hesitation before setting foot in a big body of water. What lurks just below the surface? Is there some beast full of razor-sharp teeth looking for an easy meal? It's this combination of the real and the unknown that makes Bruce so utterly terrifying. Though South Korean filmmaker Pong Joon-ho is no stranger to the socially conscious thriller, his 2006 film The Host plays with a distinct twist in the genre. After American-sanctioned negligence results in 400 bottles of formaldehyde being poured into the Han River in Seoul, something terrifying begins to take shape. A string of strange sightings crop up, all detailing a strange amphibian creature roaming the riverbanks, and a monster finally emerges from the murky depths, wreaking havoc on the city and its populace. Dubbed the Gwormal, the creature resembles a cross of a fish and a salamander, with some horrifying new additions thrown in for good measure. What makes the creature so eerie, though, is the fact that its backstory has real-world origins. In 2000, the U.S. really did dump all that formaldehyde into the Han River, causing actual mutations in the indigenous fish population. Theoretically, the Gwormal could emerge from the river's waters at any moment, and America would be totally to blame. To many of the patrons at Spencer's Gifts, Chucky is a friend till the end. To others, he's a devil doll whose cackle echoes through countless nightmares. Played to perfection by Brad Dorif, serial killer Charles Lee Ray becomes the horror icon we know and fear when he transfers his soul into the rubbery vessel of a doll. Ever since 1988's Child's Play, Dorif is the only one who has played the demented doll in the franchise's main canon, and with season two of Chucky on the way, there's no end in sight either. In Bride of Chucky, the doll gets a Frankenstein-style makeover, turning from a walking, talking evil doll to a straight-up terrifying monster. Laugh all you want, but the Chucky fear is real. Innocence bastardized into maniacal malevolence in a red-headed package. Chucky makes us fear what we should love, and for that reason alone, he's a scary story legend. Sinister tells the story of a true crime novelist who accidentally unleashes Bagul, an angry pagan deity that devours the souls of children. Don't be fooled, though, because Bagul is not your average child-eating monster. He first possesses children and influences them to kill their families in some seriously gruesome ways. Once they've committed the crime, the creature transports the children to the netherworld, where he slowly consumes their souls. With blotchy gray skin and shoulder-length black hair, Bagul takes a human-like form. 
You might even mistake him for a human before getting a glimpse of his dreadful face. But what makes Bagul so dangerous is his longevity. The Eater of Children's origins can be traced back to Babylonian times, when he was once accused of religious plagiarism after replicating his brother Moloch's child sacrifice rituals, forcing Moloch to shut his mouth with ash for eternity. Talk about old school. Guillermo del Toro knows a few things about monsters. For example, the writer and director won an Oscar for The Shape of Water, about a woman who falls in love with a fish man, while movies such as Hellboy are chock full of gruesome beasts and creatures. How big can it be? Arguably his most horrifying creation, however, came with the 2006 historical fantasy horror Pan's Labyrinth. In this movie, Doug Jones plays the Pale Man, who is truly the stuff of del Toro's darkest dreams. The Pale Man is a pale, thin man whose skin hangs off him like a robe, and his facial features are mostly missing, making him pretty unpleasant to look at. Once he opens up his hands and reveals that his eyes are on his palms, however, he goes from unpleasant to outright frightening. Del Toro once described him as a representation of all institutional evil feeding on the helpless. And if that's not terrifying, what is? The Lasser Glass is a mirror that is capable of manipulating reality for anyone who comes near it, and has killed 45 people and counting. In Mike Flanagan's pulse-pounding film Oculus, it faces off against Kaylee and Tim, two traumatized siblings whose family was ripped apart by the mirror years ago. While most cursed objects are revealed to be associated with some outside participant or demonic presence, in Oculus, the Lasser Glass is the whole presence. The antique has been taking lives since at least 1754, and it can bend perceptions in a deeply creepy and tragic way, relentlessly messing with time, space, and its victims' heads. Worse yet, the heroes of Oculus are surprisingly clever as far as horror movie protagonists go, making their continued inability to overcome the mirror's dark enchantments all the scarier. Cosmic horror is a tough thing to depict, as it is, by its very nature, beyond the comprehension of the human mind. Still, movies such as the 2018 adaptation of Jeff Vandermeer's novel Annihilation somehow pull it off, successfully surpassing the boundaries of the imagination. One of the most jarring threats in the movie is the creature that stalks the explorers, tasked to probe into the quarantine zone. This four-legged beast looks enough like some kind of prehistoric bear, but with a few notable differences. A human skull is embedded on the left side of the creature's head, and it can emit a call that not only sounds human, but like the specific voice of one of the explorers it killed earlier in the film. <laughs> This bear is not mimicking its victims, though. Its victims assimilate into its body, meaning that they might not be truly dead once their physical form shuffles off its mortal coil. And that is cosmically horrifying. The original Hellraiser is a genuinely scary, goopy, and gory horror movie with a wonderfully demented premise. The Cenobites appear when daring humans seek out pleasures beyond their capacity, as Frank does in the original 1987 film. Although the Cenobites' torturous impact can be deeply disturbing, the creatures themselves are as entertaining as they are scary. With lipless bared teeth, mutated heads, and, of course, pins stuck through their faces, the Cenobites are like ghostly body mod fanatics with a knack for rending flesh from bones. Over the series' ten movies and counting, they've been a persistently dangerous, yet admittedly cool-looking, presence. There are few instances where someone can just utter a single name and a myriad of images will pop into their mind. Simply say Freddy, though, and basically everybody will conjure up an image of Freddy Krueger. The slasher who comes for you in your dreams is so singular and sticky that the name Freddy belongs almost entirely to him. Wes Craven first introduced audiences to the sweater-wearing, claw-handed killer in 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street, and for nearly four decades now, he's been one of the premier names in the world of horror. Run from it, hide from it, it's fruitless. Everyone sleeps, everyone dreams, and that's when Freddy is gonna come for you. Regardless of whether you watch the Japanese Ringu or the American remake, The Ring, chances are you're going to be scared witless by a little girl with long black hair. Sadako, or Samara in her American iteration, is a ghostly figure whose voice tells people they will die in seven days after they watch a cursed videotape. She's on the VHS itself, crawling out of a well with her hair over her eyes, but she eventually crawls right out of the television screen too, into the reality of the movie itself. Sadako doesn't have to say much beyond the old seven days line, because she's perfectly horrifying all on her own. There's something innately creepy about children in long gowns, and Sadako's feral movements make her even creepier. It's little wonder that both Samara and Sadako went on to star in several sequels in their respective franchises. 
Regardless of whether you're scared of clowns or not, you have to agree that Bill Skarsgård's iteration of Pennywise from 2017's It is one of the most menacing creatures to grace the horror genre. This otherworldly, trans-dimensional evil entity is the overarching antagonist of Stephen King's 1986 horror novel of the same name. The clown lives in the sewers in the town of Derry, using them as access points to lure the town's children to their deaths. The shape-shifting monster literally embodies every child's worst nightmare. Both the novel and the movies see him shape-shift into all kinds of different forms, hoping to elicit as much fear as possible out of its victims. Why? Because a scared child tastes better. The 2014 psych horror movie The Babadook introduces a monster representing, among other things, the contradictory struggles of parenthood. Single mother Amelia is raising her troubled son Sam, her sanity hanging on by a thread. Then, one night, Sam brings a bedtime story to her titled Mr. Babadook, featuring a tall and thin white-faced humanish creature in a top hat with long, taloned fingers. Sporting an uncanny grin with what seems like way too many teeth, the Babadook torments his victims once they learn about him. Its ability to infiltrate, possess, and compel its victims to kill is its most terrifying power, but the Babadook's expressionist aesthetic alone contains more than enough nightmare fuel to keep you up at night. 1979 saw the cinematic introduction of one of the most recognizable and frightening creatures to ever grace the silver screen, the Xenomorph. Making its big screen debut in Ridley Scott's Alien, the Xenomorph stalks the corridors of the Nostromo, abducting or killing its crew one by one. It's a frightening beast by almost every metric you can apply, but even worse is its shockingly disturbing life cycle. Once a hapless victim encounters a Xenomorph egg, it opens up to release a facehugger, tough, bony crawlers that leap onto the victim face and impregnate them with a xenomorph fetus. The young alien feeds off its host's body until it bursts out of their chest, killing them instantly. It then rapidly grows into a full-fledged and horrifying adult. Every stage of the process is terrifying and violent, and the result is a mixture of xenomorph and the species of its victim. In other words, every single aspect of its being is a deadly violation of the natural order as we know it. I can't lie to you about your chances, but... You have my sympathies. As one of the most revered horror movies in history, John Carpenter's 1982 classic, The Thing, barely requires an introduction. Essentially, the movie follows a team of American researchers in Antarctica, led by R.J. McCready, who are befouled by a parasitic alien organism that mimics the form of whatever life it consumes. It's hard to say what the creature's true form is, since it so effortlessly incorporates its victims and imitates them. That's part of the film's tension, of course. As Childs asks, if I was an imitation, a perfect imitation, how would you know if it was really me? The thing of the thing is also scary mid-transformation, when uncanny faces and human organic matter mix and mingle with tentacles and foreign goo. By far the most frightening thing about it, though, is the fact that it could be absolutely anybody. The end result? An endless array of jump scares and shock betrayals, a sense of tension that never lets up, and one of the most contentious and unsettling endings in horror movie history. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Slash Film videos about your favorite horror movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.